Well, dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Ah, the good old days. When we use that expression, we look back wistfully on a time in our life that may have been more peaceful, maybe less complicated, maybe a time filled with people who are no longer with us, whom we miss. Ah, the good old days is how we reflect on a time that has been, or maybe there is a time now that you will look back on and say, those were good days. What were those days for you as you come into this space for worship today? Where do you look back and wistfully say, ah, oh, the good old days. For the people of God, the people of God, Israel, they would look back at a time when King David would reign and they would say, ah, oh, the good old days of King David. Today, we enter into two weeks of focusing on the story of David. This week is David the early years. Next week, more about David as king. When God's people would look back on the good old days, they usually are reflecting a bit more on the time when David was serving as king. But it is good for us to spend time in David's story so that we hear about his good old days before he became king. In our reflecting on them, we learn something new. We are invited into the story anew. Maybe as you read chapter 10 in preparation for this week, or as you heard again a summary of chapter 10 in our video today, something was new to you, something that you had forgotten about in the story. And so it goes. Sometimes when we look back on the past, we remember the victories much more than the challenges. Take, for example, the central story of the Old Testament reading today, the story of David and Goliath. We know this story very well. It's one of our favorites from childhood if we grew up reading the Bible or grew up in Sunday school. It's one of those stories that just sticks with us. It's this great story of how a little boy faces a giant and fells him with just one smooth stone. Goliath, likely seeing this boy approach him, had taken off his helmet, thus exposing his temple, which was a target for that stone, and a well-placed stone would fell the giant right in front of all of these armies of Israel. But more than a story of a little boy who defeats a giant, it is a story that shows the power of God. For David arrives on the scene not only with his slingshot and a few small stones, but with the power of the word. David says to Goliath, you come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord, the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And there it is, that word and a stone and the giant is defeated. This story is a powerful one in its telling. Some people have chalked up this story as one of David just having a good attitude. That's how he beat that giant, they will say. All the other ones looked at Goliath and said, he's so big, I can't win. Whereas David looked at Goliath and said, he's so big, I can't miss. <laughs> But people of God know this story to be much more than a story of a good attitude or a can-do spirit. No, this is a story of the power of God. The power of God to enter into life, enter into this young boy's experience and bring down the giant. But to limit this courage story, this story of David's courage, to just that moment in the valley is to forget all that happened before in the early years of David's life. For central to David facing the giant is the fact that he was a shepherd. The shepherding is, in fact, crucial to the narrative. Think about it for a moment. Oftentimes, when it comes to stories of shepherds, we imagine that tranquil scene around the nativity. 
We think of the shepherds out tending their fields. We think of the serenity of the life of the shepherd. Now, David likely knew that as well. In fact, we learn in our reading again today that David was a musician, and likely his time out shepherding the flocks in the field offered him many hours to play his harp, his lyre, and to sing psalms, to author those songs of faith we continue to sing to this day. In fact, we know that King Saul, in his declining mental health, would call upon someone to soothe him in the midst of his woe. His advisors understood that David, the shepherd boy, had a gift for music, and so they called him from the fields, and little David played and sang for King Saul so that his mind would have rest from the agony it was experiencing. But along with that time of shepherding would come other responsibilities, not just serenely leading the sheep to water and to places where they would find nourishment, but also in defending and protecting the sheep. Surely there were times when David, all alone, a little boy in the wilderness, was afraid, and yet he felt that God continued to be with him, and he was able to defend himself and his flock in the midst of challenges. How do we know this? Well, we know this because it comes up in this central story of David and Goliath. Sometimes we forget the detail that David, in fact, volunteered himself to fight the giant. He wasn't just thrust out into the valley to face the giant. He didn't go unwillingly. He actually went to King Saul and asked if he could go and fight this person. And King Saul sent him. In fact, let's hear that part of the story again. I'll have you read the part of David today. I'll read the parts of Saul and narrator. So your parts are in white. David said to Saul, Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are just a boy, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, David said, So Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. If you'll click back one screen, notice again that he gives example here of how it is that he struck down the lion and the bear and how it is that he did so just with the, probably the staff in his hand. Remember in the story how Goliath said, what am I that you come to me with sticks? Well, this is what David knew. This was a way that he trusted that he would have the ability to fight this giant. And then on the next screen, all of this was not of his own doing. It was pointing to the one who had saved him in the past and who would be with him now in the future. This marvelous story continues to invite us into considering our story as well. In fact, I was reminded of this story and the power of being sent out and anointed with promise just a few weeks ago as we gathered with 38 young people who, confirmed, who affirmed their baptismal promises and who confirmed their faith. The confirmation service brings forward these 38 young people who renounce all the forces that defy God, and then they confess a faith in God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, just as you will in a few moments as we continue worship together. And then each one of them take hold of the baptismal promises and say, I will faithfully live out this life of faith with the help of God, not on my own but with the help 
of God. Lots of Davids in front of us, sent out. Caitlin was one of those who was confirmed. She's being very helpful today. She did not know I was going to have her do this. So Caitlin, come on up here. After we have heard this renouncing, after we have this confession of faith, after we have opportunity to hear an affirmation of baptismal promises, well then, we have pastors. Pastor Jason, you didn't know I was going to call you up, but come on up. I'll have you take off your shepherding robe. And wearing these robes of white are confirmants clothed in their baptismal promises, kneel for a blessing. So Pastor Jason will just kind of model how this happens in the confirmation service. And we say these words, this prayer of blessing. Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, stir up in Caitlin the gift of your Holy Spirit. Confirm her faith. Guide her life. Empower her in her serving. Give her patience in suffering, and bring her to everlasting life. Amen. What a beautiful prayer for Caitlin as she sets out into this journey of living out the confirmed faith in Christ. Thanks for coming forward. Thank you. I often meet with confirmants before the service, a time to hear about their faith story, but also for me to talk through the words of the liturgy. And it is this prayer that I think is the best gift that we send these young people away with on that confirmation day. To know that God continues to confirm our faith and to give us patience in suffering. I tell each confirmant, I hope your life has no suffering. I hope there's no point in your life where you feel like you're not going to make it. But be assured that this God will be with you always. And will give you the patience you need in times of suffering. To hear this story today of David reminds us that even though he fought the giant and the giant fell, his challenges did not end there. Remember King Saul, how he went after David and was relentless in trying to kill him? Later we know that David does become king but then we discover next week how his greatest enemy will actually be himself. To limit the story of David to just one encounter with a giant is to limit the extent to which God reaches into the complexities of David's life. And I think that then knowing this helps to open up for us how the God that we continue to worship is, was, and has been, and will always be with us, so that when we face whatever enormous giants may come our way, whether struggles with sickness or family challenges or financial burdens or you tell me what it is that is enormous in your life, well, the same God who has shepherded you through the past will lead you into the future. A God who uses unlikely people in amazing circumstances to bring about redemption and hope and promise is the God who goes with you. Therefore, may the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, be with you. Amen. Please rise. <clears throat>